And we're live. Welcome back to the Ubuntu Online Summit. Um, this is a session I've been looking forward to all day. I've got uh, Matt Bruzek. Go ahead and wave. Hey. And uh, Charles Butler. Hello. All right. And they're going to be presenting all the container technologies and how you can use them with Juju and Ubuntu. This is a really hot topic that uh, everyone's talking about. Of course, Kubernetes, Swarm, a bunch of things that start with F, like Flocker. And it's a whole new world of different container technologies. So we're really concentrating on bringing you guys all this goodness so that you can just grab Juju, spit out what you need, um, and then get going deploying all, the, all these great applications on the containers. So with that, fellas, I'm going to go ahead and, and back up a bit, shut my camera off, and let you guys take it. Well, greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Charles Butler, and I work on the Juju Solutions team uh, with my, my cohort here, Matt Brujak. We've been working very diligently in the last uh, cycle over learning more from upstream vendors and how they're deploying software using Docker and how uh, containers have kind of evolved as a whole over the last six months. Um, a lot of buzz going around uh, regarding container orchestrators. Uh, and if you remember from the last uh, Ubuntu Online Summit, we debuted our, one our Kubernetes 1.0 bundle. And since then, uh, Kubernetes has iterated. They're getting ready to release their 1.0.1 1 uh, point release, and we are uh, tracking that very, very closely. So uh, I, I don't want to dive too deep into this, Matt, since I know that you've done a lot of work on Kubernetes. Did you want to kind of pick up the flag here? And sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so what we have, we have two different stories for the Kubernetes charms the way they are right now. Um, we've got a developer story. So if you're a developer, you want to, um, you want to start using Kubernetes, um, you just you clone the repo, and the charms and bundle are already in there. And uh, we have a, if you set the, the, the Kubernetes provider to Juju, you can, uh, you can kube up, and, and it'll build your source code, and then deploy, the, or put that in the charm, and then deploy the charms for you. That was now, our, that Matt, was our let's, let's say that I've hacked on a new feature, and I'm working out of a feature branch. Will this pack my new thing that I just wrote into that? Yeah. Is that what's it'll, happening? It will. It will. It'll. So you just, if you're working on code, this is this is the fastest way to get trying Kubernetes with your latest code. Yep. Okay. And and we also have a, a version story. Um, we call that the charm store. The the charm store version. You can you can specify what version of Kubernetes you want to deploy. And what what the what happens is the charms will be deployed. Um, the Go compiler will be put on the Kubernetes master. It'll compile that version of Kubernetes. It'll it'll go in the background, clone the clone the repository, you know, get the code for you, get that version of Kubernetes, compile it, and then and then deploy those on that charm. So if you want to deploy, you know, try out the newest version, which is 1.0.7, is a pre-release right now. You can, you can give that a shot to see what's coming up in uh, version 1.1 of Kubernetes. Um, so those are the those are the traditional charms that are out there right now, available right now. Um, again, we're we're in the upstream project. We're in the Kubernetes um, uh, branches. If you clone the if you clone the repository, we're in the cluster directory. Look for Juju, look for the Juju directory. Um, but uh, what Chuck and I are working on for the next release is is um, a, a different way to deploy Kubernetes. Um, so before we actually show that, uh, okay. I want to interject for just a second, Matt. I'm going to share sure. my screen. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is presenting to everybody. You may want to bring this yep. up. Um, I see that. Okay. So let me pop this in the sidebar. Okay. Um, so this is our traditional bundle, how it's visualized and how it looks. There's a lot of components that are here, and it's not necessarily obvious what's connected to uh, to what in, in terms of a subordinate. Like this Kubernetes unit here is actually subordinate to Docker, and in order to horizontally scale your Kubernetes service, to scale your workers, you juju add unit Docker in this particular cluster, and that's not very intuitive. Uh, but that's something that we walked into it knowing because we wanted to independently version Docker and have the ability to affect change on just that particular layer of this bundle. Uh, so we we went back to the drawing board. We took a look at this and we started attacking this in another way using layers and started writing it in terms that made more sense to us as Charm authors and we think transposed pretty well. Uh, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. You have the the new version deployed, right? So we can see an immediate visualization of that. I do, I do. Let me uh, let me share that window. Um, it's right here. So it it looks a little bit different. Um, we we've compressed all the Kubernetes master and the Kubernetes node into one. Um, we've got we still need etcd. 
Um, we've also got Flannel running inside the Kubernetes um, because we need that for the software-defined network so that the pods can talk to each other on different hosts. So right. we've, we've compressed a little bit in there, but what, what's coming down the pipe and what we're working on in the new release is deploying all of the Kubernetes bits rather than from GitHub and compiling it. We're, 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 putting, we're, we're using the, 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 the Docker container to deliver the, the binary from, from the upstream. So, um, you know, Google builds the Kubernetes binaries and puts them in Docker containers, and that seems to be the, you know, the prevalent way that, that uh, people are deploying this. So we've reimagined the Kubernetes charm to actually just do... Um, to, to, to deploy Docker, to get the Docker containers running for Kubernetes, and we've put all of those. Um, so there's many services running inside this Kubernetes uh, node right now in this service. Um, and if you look, if I hit, if I bring up the, uh, the screen here, um, we actually have two units of Kubernetes running. Um, this, is a, this is a Juju abstraction. Um, you can scale this up to be um, many more units by by adding units here. You can say I want to I want to add another unit um, of Kubernetes, but this is running in my Amazon cloud right now. There's two uh, Kubernetes units running, so it's Kubernetes zero and Kubernetes one. Um, they're all running the Docker containers so that, so that they can talk to each other. They can they can um, schedule services and and just be resilient. Uh, we found that. You know, running all those uh, services in, in the Docker container makes it much easier to scale and much more uh, resilient to failure. So we've got those uh, all compressed into one. So, um, so Matt, let me let me interject one more second. You you mentioned something that's kind of interesting to me uh, that we we are now doing primary delivery with just the the application containers. Is that correct? Like, yep, top to bottom. Uh, including Flannel is now being run in, in Docker on that host, inflecting right. change on the Docker daemon, and, and all of those independent components can now be upgraded pretty much at a snap if you've got the, the image backing in your private repository or in the Docker hub. That's right, yeah. And it seems to be that's the way the upstream is 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 uh, recommending that they just uh, deploy these. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the friendly folks at Google are building these Kubernetes Docker images for us. We're just using Docker to deploy Kubernetes and then set up this uh, this cluster, and right now it's a cluster of two, but we can we can expand it much much bigger. Um, we're still using a separate etcd uh, um, unit, um, and etcd can be uh, scaled up as, as much as you need here for resiliency or you know um, for for not having a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got a visualization that we've built in. Um, it's it's something called uh, working with our partners from Weave. It's something called Weave Scope, and uh, I can show that here. I can show that uh, going to the public address. I made this ex um, exposed to the internet uh, just before the the stand up or before the meeting here, and you can see the Docker containers that are running inside there. There, there. Uh, we have Kubelet running. We have Kube Proxy running. Um, we have uh, Kubernetes Master. Let's see. C Advisor is running. That's another way to visualize what's going on and to, to kind of monitor what you're going on in your containers. But this is a this is a, a product by our partners Weave that has um, a way to visualize what's going on with the um, with the containers. When Chuck, you click on one of those nodes, it looks like it was showing an output. Uh, just to kind of cover what that is, I see here that it's that it's showing us it's some basic container information, like what the ID is that it's running on its host. But then below, I see this thing called TCP connections. Yep. What's is that actually giving me kind of a net stat listing of everything it's connected to? Yeah, and this is this is this is the traffic. Um, Weave scope is is uh, focused on network um, traffic. So this is the stuff that these are the connections that this container is making to the other uh, other containers. You can see uh, 172 is is a Docker um, um, a Docker connection within the host, and then there's also making local host with uh, different mappings here. You can. You can see these things. This is a great visualization tool to see what's going on, and we've used it to debug and to, you know, to figure out why certain things weren't working the way we were hoping to. But um, you can see that the kubelet has a lot less connections. Um, of course, the proxy one is going to have um, more, um, but the master one here has just a, a ton of connections going on right now. So. 
So yep. this seems really awesome, Matt, and I think it's cool that I've got the network visualization, a little bit of heuristics into what's going on in the machine. You know, yep. what would be really cool is if I had something to monitor these in real time so I could see the CPU load that's happening from a container. Yeah, there's a tool called uh, C-Advisor that uh, people from Google also uh, produce. It's a separate product, and it lets you look into your Docker containers. We have that deployed on all the Kubernetes nodes as well. So let me go over here and switch to the Kubernetes units. And if I want to look at C-Advisor on, on the node 0, let's, put, let's go to, I believe that's here. Um, so C-Advisor has a, has a web user interface here, and it shows you all the containers. It shows you these, uh, the CPU, the memory, the file system <coughs> on these dials here. And this is, this is also like a process listing of what's going on in, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the application container. You can see there's some graphs That particular here. listing looks like it's coming from the host. Um, oh, is that so right? OK. I, I believe that the primary overview is the host. And then whenever okay. you click into Docker containers, you get the scoped metrics. OK, OK. But you can see that there's live um, CPU metrics here. Um, and you know with, with the graphs, <coughs> excuse me. There is uh, the memory usage, and and we also have throughput throughput here. So this is a really good way to to monitor your uh, your containers, and and then the file systems are at the bottom. So, as Chuck pointed out, you go to the very top of this, you can click on um, Docker containers, and then you can see the Docker containers that are running on this host. <coughs> and and here again, you see this the names that I was showing in the in the weave scope. Here's proxy. Um, that has uh, that has to do with networking for for uh, Kubernetes, so that the pods can talk to each other, and you can you can introspect the weave scope a Docker container itself and just see what's going on with that <coughs> with that uh, container. Yeah, that's, oh, excuse me. That's really cool, Matt. So so this gives me a little bit more heuristics into actually what's going on inside my Kubernetes cluster if I want to diagnose. Say somebody pings me and says, that, you know, hey, our application's running a little, you know, it's a little stuttery, we're noticing. So, like, you have any idea what's going on? We're not seeing anything in the logs. You pull up the advisor, you see that it's using 100% CPU, and it's just sitting there doing nothing with nothing going on over the network. Right, so you know, oh, I, maybe I should restart this, or whatever the case may be. So, uh, while Juju is not directly uh, servicing this information to you, we've deployed an application with Juju. We're shipping it with our Kubernetes installs, basically. So you get the heuristics into your cluster that you need to make informed decisions about how to work with it and what's actually running inside of it. Yeah, that's great. And this is this is a really cool tool that uh, that Google created. It's it's running already in our Docker containers um, on the Kubernetes unit. So. Chuck, is there anything else you'd like to sh like me to show here? Do you want me to run the action that launches something in Kubernetes? That would actually be cool, so because we can use those tools to visualize them coming online. Um, okay. Like if you if you leave Weave Scope up and you you run the action, um, the the action is Juju action do on one of the K8s units and then guessbook yep. example. This is something that we have shipped in our layer. Um, none of this has actually landed in the charm store yet. This is going to be landing as far as like a preview release and going through proper alpha beta phase and probably the next. I would say what over the next month and a half, two months, Matt. Yeah, that, yeah. that would be a, an accurate projection of when you can start to like actually sink your, your teeth into it and work with uh, the, the newer stuff. If you want to get involved in the early development process, feel free to reach out to us on uh, pound juju on irc.freedom.net or ping us on the mailing list juju at listletubuntu.com. Uh, that again will be uh, surfaced at the end of the. The hangout, but um, uh, the point being is that this is all very early stuff. So that's right, that's right, and we're we're still working on it for the next iteration. So this will this will change a little bit. We'll, we'll refine it a little bit more and get it a little more uh, production grade. Um, so can everybody see my uh, Chuck? Can you see my uh, terminal here? Yeah, I think your font size looks good. <laughs> okay, um, I just wanted to show everybody that we deployed this with a bundle. Um, the the juju deployer command uh, we have a we have a bundle here on my system and just with one command I deployed the the Kubernetes the Kubernetes cluster with two nodes with etcd with weave <clears throat> and the proper relations between the two it it really demonstrates the uh, the power of juju and and being able to encapsulate a whole solution in one bundle file I mean that's all that we did I happened to deploy this on um, my 
local machine as well because I wanted to make sure I had a backup in case something uh, went wrong in Amazon. So this is the same bundle being deployed on my KVM machine um, locally on, on my laptop. All right, so <clears throat> we have the status going here. This is a uh, We've, we've made use of the extended status messages, so you can see that the etcd leader is running. Um, we, we, we're still working on the messaging here, but, but Weave has started, and, and, and it shows you what port you can visit at, uh, Weave Scope on. We've already done that. But this, this is uh, the, the, the Juju status for my Amazon container in the tabular format, just showing that these are real servers <coughs> in Amazon right now. Um, running this Kubernetes cluster. So I'll go back over here and then what I was going to do is juju action do Kubernetes. Um, I'm going to give it a unit and say um, guest book example. Yep. This is our this is our action to run the something in Kubernetes to launch the uh, guestbook example within Kubernetes. <coughs> All right. So if I go back here, Kubernetes one is is this address, and we see that it's currently running in the context of the guestbook example, and that's returned. So yep. it looks like it executed really, really quick. Yeah, yeah. With Kubernetes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a a tunnel so that I can see inside the uh, Kubernetes unit. Um, with sh with a, a tool called Shuttle, um, Ubuntu at this address. It's also important to note that this is a temporary measure while we're doing the development. Uh, the next iteration is actually putting on having the reverse proxy head sit in front of that, and yep. there will be yep. a documented process to get your applications to automatically show up through that load balancer. This is just an in-depth thing that we're working around. Yep, yep. This is just one of the one of the things we're going actually through two layers of software-defined networks. So this is uh, it's complicated to say to say uh, say it lightly. Um, but what I can do is I can juju SSH to the Kubernetes um, one unit. You uh, misspelled Kubernetes. Did I? Yep. Sorry about that. And, and you can use Kubernetes with the kube control um, binary. So you can say kube control um, uh, git services, or SVC. Mm -hmm. Okay, And you can see that the front end is running at this address within the Kubernetes uh, system. Um, <coughs> As you know, as I explained, we're also are running Docker on this container, so you could say Docker PS and see all the Docker containers here. There's a lot running inside of here. We've got the, the scheduler, the API server, the controller, the proxy, the kubelet, and um, you know, so Sky DNS for doing DNS or the, the, the software-defined network. We've got C Advisor running here. Um, and then these other containers are guestbook running. And so kube control get services um, will show us the IP address that we can do. And, and once you're on the machine, you can, you can curl that U URL. <clears throat> do I need to expose it? Uh, no. Should be open by default. Run get pods. Get, oh, kube control get pods. Or get RC, rather, because it's, it's a replication controller, sorry. RC. Front end, that's the one we're, we're using, right? Right. Um, OK, so if you, if you run the get pods, and if it doesn't say that it's ready, it's still starting up. And this does happen. As the cluster tries to launch a resource, it, uh, it, the scheduler is also introspecting to see if the host can handle it. If it runs into any issues of it going through a restarting state and it's on an N plus one. So yeah. the fact that they're all pending means that they haven't started yet. They might be pulling the containers. Uh, yeah. They could be you know, introspecting the host to see if it's got enough resources to actually run the containerized workload with what it thinks it needs. Yeah, and there's, um, schedu there's scheduling going on here from Kubernetes. So there's, 
there's a lot of uh, a lot of things going on here. So should I watch this? Uh, you can. It can take anywhere <laughs> from 15 seconds, which is about norm for spinning these up if the if the image is already pre-cached, to you know three four minutes. Depends on how how loaded the GCR.io uh, image registry is. Yeah, we've got them almost all running now, except for the uh, the front end, or the third front end. If you end curl that address now, you should get a response. There's now a pod. Now, Kubernetes okay. models things a little differently than Juju. Juju's got charms, and charms represent our service. Uh, in Kubernetes, a service represents just an endpoint in uh, the Kubernetes cluster for you to re-access a source, and it could be backed by many pods. And what Kubernetes calls pods is very much akin to what Juju calls units. So as you horizontally scale out a service, you're adding units to a charm. In Kubernetes, you add a service, and then you add pods behind that service. Because you can declare a service having zero pods behind it and make an endpoint to nowhere. Yep. Um, yep. So what I'm going to do now is, since I have that tunnel open, I'm going to try to open that locally on my laptop again. This would be done with, um, this would be done with the reverse proxy stuff with Juju. We just haven't got that all figured out yet. We're, it's a current a development item. So what I'm doing is I'm saying HTTP to the 10.1.255.47. And you can see that Guestbook is indeed running here. In Kubernetes, we launched it with an action from Juju. And <clears throat> the cluster was deployed with Juju. The, you know, everything, everything is running and, and managed for you within Juju. And then Kubernetes ran the Guestbook application. So, so that's, that's all I had to show. Um, that's pretty excellent, Matt. Um, do we want to dive into what the charms look like now versus what they were based on before as the traditional charms? They were powered primarily by uh, plain old Python as well as some Ansible mixed in there as well for some of the deployment objects. Yeah. Whereas now... Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say that now that we're, we're looking at layers, that, that story looks a lot better. Did you want to touch on some of the high points there? Yeah. Um, Chuck and I, we're... we're, we're Developing, we're reimagining the Kubernetes charm. We decided to go with the new um, charm, uh, the reactive, and the layered uh, approach here. And it's much, it's much more concise, much more um, focused on just the Kubernetes code because we can import a Docker layer that takes care of the Docker parts for us. So the the charms no longer are are huge because we we can we can. Uh, take advantage of the other layers that, that have been written for us. So uh, Chuck's going to demonstrate the Docker layer um, next and what he can do with that. But, I need um, 30 seconds, my, yeah, my Wi-Fi. No problem. No problem. So, so what I'm saying is um, we, we started with the Docker layer, and then we built the Kubernetes layer on top. And so just the Kubernetes charms are much smaller and much more concise because we're only worrying about the Kubernetes parts. And of course, we're using. Um, C advisor and some other things, but th those are very small parts, and we're using um, industry uh, industry best practices. We're using a compose uh, a composer file where um, it's it's a it's a Docker notation where you can you can put a bunch of Docker run commands in a in a file, and then we're using comp Docker compose to run those those uh, those files from inside the charm, and therefore our charm code is very small, very easy to maintain. And we can build that um, um, when when the layers change or when you change the Kubernetes layer. I can show a build here. <clears throat> um, Corey uh, John's already talked about this on on the layer uh, building from earlier today, but um, charm build. This is how this is how we're building the layer um, right now. And so that builds a, a, a K8 charm for on my local system, and it's using the the basic layer, it's using the Docker layer, and it's now using a flannel layer. So, so it's using those three layers to create the K8 charm as you see right now. It's also important to note that that flannel layer is subject to go away and become a subordinate charm that mixes into the service. Um, right. Right. Uh, right now, the reason why it's a layer is because it was easy to write. Uh, the final layer is incomplete, and the end product will end up being a, a subordinate so that we can extend and mix and match components as, as you wish, uh, which is going to make bundle creation super simple. 
Uh, tracking the project is going to be easy as well because now we can independently rev that component, which is uh, talking in tandem with Kubernetes. It's not something that Kubernetes itself is actually managing. So, right, right, and and also I wanted to point out that we could be running the etcd uh, Docker container inside the, the the Kubernetes unit. We chose to put that outside because we have a Docker um, where we have a, a, a Juju unit <coughs> charm, excuse me, for etcd already. And that, that makes it a lot more flexible, and it can be maintained by Juju rather than all in one in, in the in the small Docker container. So when you're running a Kubernetes cluster, the etcd is the the backend database that's storing all the information for your Kubernetes service. So if let's just say that uh, you know high water hit the data center and disasters happen, so you need to restore. That's going to be the first thing you reach for because if you can restore that etcd data, you can recover your Kubernetes cluster. Basically, a snapshot in time of that state. And Kubernetes will do its best to bring all the app containers back online as long as it's got connectivity to the resources where it pulled the images from and uh, the, the other services that has enough nodes to actually run the full workload. Um, this is something that we're going to be testing moving forward over the next six months and making our Kubernetes deployments more robust, more reliable, and more failure uh, resilient. And in the event that the worst does happen, how do you actually restore from Kubernetes backup? And that's going to be the primary method is ensuring that you've got a, a high-integrity NCD backup and you're able to restore that relatively painlessly and then reconnect to it. Um, all right, I think I've got my workstation back up and running. I apologize for that brief technical delay. Um, layers. And we were going to take a look at Docker. So the, the old Docker charm was an Ansible-based charm. And I don't know if I can make this present to everyone. I don't think it's going to let me. But OK, uh, looking at this. Uh, I'm, our, our, I'm manually driving your screen, so just You are yeah. awesome, George. Thank you. Um, so that's George Castro, the grip, everybody. Best, uh, best master of ceremonies ever. Uh, OK, so looking at, at the Docker charm, historically it was an Ansible based charm. It had a lot of YAML. It took anywhere from 5 to 12 minutes, depending on how slow or fast your host was, to install Ansible, get all the dependencies, set up Docker, and set some options in a config file. That, that was its basic core job. And while that was cool and easy to read, it started to lose its appeal when we were standing things up repeatedly, and we ate that eight-minute cost every time we wanted to stand something up. So the new approach to the Docker charm is pretty much pulling what's available on get.docker.io and piping this through into, into the Juju charm. We're shipping with it. The only thing that we did was we modified it for some status set. And by taking this approach, we've eliminated the need to, to curl and pipe the pseudo bash because we're auditing the script and shipping it with the charm. Uh, it's now clearly detailing what it's doing on the host. We now get support for Debian, CentOS, and Ubuntu out of the box with this. And uh, we've got a background process that I, as the maintainer, have running. And whenever there's an update, it gives me a bit of report of what's happening upstream versus what we're shipping in the charm. Uh, which is really nice. So the, the other side of this is that the charm itself has also gotten super skinny. Um, there's just one, there's just a couple hooks in here. Uh, we still run through the install hook. We install Docker. Um, raise a lot of state. There's a lot of messaging back to the user, which is really good. But we also started bundling the core components that we need to start working with Docker in this charm. Uh, we're, we're bundling uh, Docker Compose, making sure the Ubuntu user has access to the Docker daemon. Uh, We've even shipped one of the experimental features now where you can get memory accounting in Docker, which will actually reboot the host during the installation cycle. So if you enable this, this option, it's got big, bold text around it in the config option that this will reboot your host. So don't do this on systems you've got already workloads running on. But uh, you can enable that support so that way you can start working with the more advanced features of like C Advisor. Um, the other side of this is that there's now two states. There's a docker.ready, and there's a docker.available. So if you're a plug-in manufacturer, you're working with LibNetwork, or any of the newer things that are coming into Docker Core, and you want to plug into this uh, this particular charm, you write a layer. And in that layer, you just react to the docker.ready event. Because when Docker is ready, there's no workloads on it. So you're free to go through and, and launch your software to find networking daemon, or uh, modify the options, uh, things of that nature. And then whenever docker.available raises, at that point, the, the workloads will start being placed on the daemon, and your, your actual workload setup will continue. So what's, what's really nice about that is that we've even taken this a step further. Um, and in parent layers uh, that inherit from the Docker charm, there was a lot of subprocess.call. 
uh, commands that were just actually running Docker scripts. Like I've got one. Let's look at this little guy. It's 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 pretty simple. Like like this right here. We we define a, a command line and is a string, and then we just pipe that through a, a subprocess dot check output or check call. And and having these littered throughout our files, we're we're getting kind of messy. And I didn't really like how that looked. Like I'm I'm stuffing shell in a Python file, and I've got shell available to me in Reactive. I could have rewritten things in that, but I really like the the syntactic sugar of Python. So I set out to to fix this and. The crumbs of this are just starting to land in the upstream layer uh, in, in my repository. And I look at lib, and I look at uh, Docker. Say, hey, Chuck, can I just interrupt you there? Can you can you sure unmute thing. your can you unmute your terminal window and talk through that one? Would that yeah. work? Oh, um, is it still is it is it moving me around? I think it's I think it's on you right now. So let's try that. No, I, I've got it. it. I've got it locked to his terminal. He's fine. Keep going. Okay, sorry. I didn't see it on mine. All right, I'm bamboozled here. That's my bad for having two uh, two sessions connected. Okay, so so looking at this library, uh, I started to write a uh, a new little bit here when working with Docker, and and now we've got a, a primitive a class. So when you're writing a charm, you just from charms dot Docker includes capital Docker. We, we instantiate this class, so now we can define where we want to connect to. This is going to give us preliminary support for using. Uh, a native language in Juju to communicate with Swarm or with the host, and it's, it can happen transparently depending on conditions in your charm, which is really nice. Um, the other side of this is we get some of the the uh, existing uh, uh, methods that are available to us from the Docker CLI, because that's all this is doing is wrapping that. So if I call docker.run, I now can pass it the image, I can pass it some options that I want to run, uh, give it a, an array of volume mounts, give it an array of ports, and it's going to run through and it's going to find everything that it needs to do. It'll automatically open any public ports that you give it. Uh, the volume mounts come in and it makes sure that they exist first, um, things of that nature. So we can take some some liberty on, on behalf of the user and make charming with, with Docker a much nicer process. But this really isn't where I wanted to, to, to go is necessarily just the Docker, but the, the larger side of it is composed because Typically, whenever you launch a, an application container, it's not just by itself. It's a microservice in a series. You want to launch an entire cluster, whether that's including you know, database cache, et cetera. And maybe I just want to run this in standalone, have it all in Docker. Maybe I want to run this with remote units where we can start mixing in you know, our production uh, Postgres, and I don't have to deploy 15 different Postgres containers and, and maintain that through infrastructure and deal with the headache of data integrity there. I now have this, this well-defined, well-understood database cluster that I can interface with that Juju has enabled me to connect to. Um, so this is where Compose comes into play, and it's really nice, because you can start to mix and match these services and template just the Compose file. Um, we start off by defining a workspace, and this is a concept that Matt and I have been pioneering, and it works extremely well, where we have a, a, a subdirectory in the charm where we're managing all the files, whether that be templates, whether that's an environment file, where we're actually rendering uh, different end uh, bits to, to pass into the container. Um, all of these things that we're exposing as primitives, and, and we can start to stuff these in this particular directory, and the, the framework that we're working on here just understands this concept of a workspace. So if you have that, you can run up, you can pass it a service, and it'll start just a single service from that bundle. Uh, you can also pass kill, same option, but just a single service from that bundle, and that'll spin up and tear down uh, individual units or the entire cluster from your Docker Compose YAML file. So to, to illustrate this and not just talk about it, I wanted to put together a quick charm. So this morning I set out to write that charm, and I wrote the, I took a, a two-factor app, which is basically Redmine. And looking at this, just edit this actual file here. And looking at layer, it's really straightforward. We just include the HTTP interface because we know it's a website, and we've got layer Docker, so we get all of those bits that I've just been talking about. So we're going to take a look at Reactive, and we take a look at Redmine.py. This is my charm now, super skinny. We have a when docker.available, which tells me that I can run this. When my Docker workload is split up and everything is ready. Down into start Redmine, we just grab the config object, and we pass it the docker compose YAML. And we're, we're just running it through that renderer with any config options we have and spit it out in the files directory. From here, we instantiate our compose object, and we point it at that workspace, which is in files Redmine. We do some user messaging. We call compose.up, which actually spins up the service. And then we do some more messaging with status set. So working with, with Docker, the, the, the language for writing this in a charm has really become kind of fill in the blank, where I just take a, a few primitives that I already have for my project. 
like the Stalker Compose I handle, I'm not actually substituting in this. I'm running it through the parsing engine. So yeah, as I start to layer in different config options, I just make these updates in this Jinja template where I can say things like, you know, percent if SMTP enabled. And then render out this entire bit down here where we're actually handling SMT bits, SMTP bits. And this information can come from config, it can come from relation. There are, there are multiple different things that we can use to set this context and kind of control this deployment with just a simple templating engine. Uh, to go further than that, uh, there's also work that's being done for different things to plug into, such as where, how do we deal with our log aggregation. Uh, Logspout is going to be an add-on subordinate that we can bolt into these and attach and, and relate that to Logstash. Uh, there's also service discovery. We, we pioneered with console before and running Registrator. We're going to look at, at doing some more with that specifically to power our, our Kubernetes backends, maybe a, as a mix-in with SkyDNS or, or different things. Uh, so we're starting to see the amalgamation of, of the, the ecosystem of Docker apps and best practices and what people are doing to actually get their workloads in production come together. And we're exposing these primitives to make it to where there's almost no reason for you not to make a Juju charm to do it because it gives you a lot of flexibility and it gives the users a lot of flexibility in how they want to deploy your service, whether they want the full Docker application stack or if they want to deploy just your application container and still use their existing infrastructure or maybe some new infrastructure that they better understand and are able to inflect change upon. Um, so I, I showed the Redline charm. I've already got it deployed. And we'll see here that I've got uh, actually two services running. I've got Swarm, and I've also got this Redmine charm running. So let's start by looking at Redmine. I've got this pulled up in a browser over here. And just so that way it's not smoke and mirrors, let's go ahead and share that. And we see that we've got a, a full working Redmine here. We can go over here to uh, Projects. We'll click Add New Project call this the Ubuntu Online Summit. We'll just go ahead and create and continue. Go back to projects. We see that we've got Ubuntu Online Summit. And boom, we're in there. The, the deployment of this charm literally took me five minutes from, from the time of Juju Deploy to having the service ready and available to me. And it took absolutely no understanding of how, how to work with it. It was just something that we, we packaged up in a charm. The best practices are already there. We've got the Docker Compose YAML to, to kind of compose the bits that make this up. And now we're ready to start cutting it up and working with the different areas. So I, I want to take this as, a, as an initial opportunity to invite you to come back uh, to other learning events that we're having, such as the Juju Charmer Summit, uh, reading our blogs, interacting with us on the mailing list. And I'll make sure that I, I continue to syndicate this content, how we take this, red, this Redmine service and cut it up into smaller digestible pieces and how to connect this with existing infrastructure. Because I, I feel like that's still very much a question that's going on with, uh, with users and consumers of Juju and how, how specifically they, need, they can work with application containers in the Juju model. Um, so we've, we, we, just to recap, we've shown Kubernetes, which is a full container scheduler and uh, does a lot of automation around things that try to, try to keep your application running and online. Uh, whereas now we're looking at the primitives of Docker where we're just deploying actual uh, the containers and the formations of those containers with just a, a very bare bones charm that is very specific to your app because maybe you've already dockerized it and this is your preferred method to distribute it. Then we have the other end of the spectrum where there's users that just want to consume Docker, they just want an elastic compute, and they don't necessarily care just so long as they're not overloading their servers. They want to make sure that you know they're able to deploy all their workloads into it. And this is where Swarm comes into play. And Swarm is an interesting property of Docker as it gives you an elastic compute backend and you can launch things into it. So let me echo Docker host. Oops. And let's see what we have here. Let me make sure that I've actually got this connected. I don't. So let's export Docker host is going to equal uh, joyous cap is, I believe, I don't have proper DNS set up on my NAS cluster. So I believe it's IP addresses.53. So this is going to be TCP. And so we're going to point this to port 2377, which is our Swarm Manager port. And if I run Docker info, I'm going to see that I've currently got one node that's participating in the Swarm cluster. So I'm ready to receive Docker containers on one host. And if I run Docker PS, I see that I've already got a game running here of 2048. So if I juju add unit Swarm, and we're just going to let that run in the background while we continue to launch and take a look at different demos. 
And let's get into a uh, proper repository with Docker demos. And let's, so there's an application called Sentry. And we added our Docker Compose YAML file. We see that we've got slash Sentry. It's got a database component. A uh, couple secret keys, just, uh, just basic demo where. So I'm going to Docker Compose up tag D. Actually, just Docker Compose up tag D would be fine. If I was in a virtual lab, that would be fine. Docker Compose up tag D. And we're going to see now that it's starting to pull images, and we see that it's got an indicator here where it's telling me which host is actually pulling this image on. And I invite you to remember that we are adding a unit to our Swarm service. So we've got one that's running. We've got another that's actually coming in, and it's starting to allocate, and then it's going to join up into our Swarm cluster. So while this is running in the background, and I start to launch a couple different containers, uh, it's important to note that this was deployable with just Juju deploy. Uh, swarm out of this this particular layer. This layer is going to you're going to see this land in the charm store in my private namespace in the next week. The last remaining bit here is to get everything TLS verified and uh, secured. Uh, right now, this is a Docker cluster that sets up. It's elastic. You just relate it to etcd for coordination, and then you can scale out to n plus whatever your imagination is, uh, and they'll all be part of the same swarm cluster. Um, What's nice about this is the supports the visualization that Matt's already showed off with with scope. You can get container metrics out of it with C Advisor, uh, and all of these properties are landing in, in, our, in our containers uh, ecosystem pipe them. So uh, make sure that you check out our, our GitHub reading as well, because we're we're updating that and putting all the new new goodness there. So Matt, I feel like I've rambled for a minute. While I'm waiting for demos to come online, is there anything else that I've missed? No, I, I think you've talked about Everything I had I had to hear. Um, Redmine is is what though? I didn't I didn't get what Redmine oh. was. Uh, Redmine is a is a project management solution. So say that you've got five people that are working on a team. They need an issue tracker. You need to build a time track, uh, and you want to be able to collect issues. That's basically what Redmine is. It's like a it's like a an open source project management software. Okay. So I picked it because it was a two-factor app. It it comes with a Rails component, which is like the middleware, the actual application stack. And then there's a database component. And you can actually put that behind a load balancer. I was just trying to do something a little more different than uh, the WordPress and Media Wiki demos, where we've got more of an option with our web front ends. Sure. OK. Um, you know, I, I can continue to, to, to run this, but if we if we Docker PS, we see that we've launched with Docker Compose on my workstation talking to my, my uh, Docker Swarm deployed by Juju. And if I Docker info, I'm still running with just the one. But as this next one comes up, it'll come up with, uh, instead of nodes one, you'll see nodes two. And it will be the second node that fires in. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I need to cover. There's, there's more, but I don't recall what that may be. So um, to anybody that's watching at home, if you have questions, feel free to pipe up now. Um, I think we can give it a minute or two, see if there's any that come in. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, with, uh, with no further questions, Matt, uh, I, I think that this is the point where I, I invite people, uh, this is the call to action to please uh, engage with us on the mailing list. Let us know what your interest in containers are, what you would like to see Juju do with your application container. Uh, maybe if you've tried this in the past and you didn't, didn't necessarily enjoy it, you know, come see me. Let's talk about the, the, new, the new lingo of how to deploy these, how, how, the, layers make, how the layers work, how this, this new charm library with charm.docker.run will work for your, your particular container. Because uh, what my goal at the end of the day is is to make sure that, that you are enjoying the experience that you're having with deploying your application container and Charm and having that connect to other services by just including an interface. And some very, very lightweight code from you is just what to do with those data points. Uh, I think that with the templating system and Docker Compose, it's literally just fill in the blank. You know, this is what we have. This is what we passed in. If this exists, render this. And that way this, this topology now is mutated into this, and it's communicating with this existing service, and it's running with those credentials. So... I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff coming down the pipeline there, especially with how we're we're starting to skidding up the K8s, uh, Kubernetes charms for 
those that don't get the, the jargon, um, and, and how that's starting to shape up and look. Uh, we, we, we recoded that from the ground up in basically, what, two weeks, Matt? That's right. Probably a week. I, I, the, the reactive and, and layered approach is, is very powerful. I really like charm. I like building charms with layers. It's, uh, it's proved to be um, really good, and it, it focuses our, our code just just the parts of the service that you're, you're providing on the new one. Um, and the, the layers are reusable. They're, they're wonderful. So um, the relation part is really good, too, when you, you, can, you can import an interface um, very easily and, and rapidly and put those in, get those uh, charms talking to other charms. That's the power. That's the power of Juju, really, is talking to the other, the other services that are running out there, um, whether they're the uh, container, application containers, or, or you know, other units, um, LexD, or, or anything that we're working on here. Um, getting those, getting insight into those is, 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 a, is what our goal is. So. With uh, nothing else to add for me, is our grip still there? George? He's uh, probably out to lunch, but... <laughs> it's, it's just us for the remainder. Okay. So, <clears throat> so you launched Century. I see it's running. What, what, other, what are we waiting for here? What's, what's remaining on this part? So what we're doing now is we're waiting on Swarm to finish uh, coming up and clustering. It's currently telling me that my agent's lost, so I, I'm not real certain what's happening here, but it's, it's telling me that it's, that it's currently installing on my new node, so that makes me happy. Okay, okay. Sometimes when the agent is lost, it's from a reboot. Um, it didn't do any rebooting, did it, or no, restarted? No, none of these units had the, the enable C groups on, so what I'm thinking is happening is that... Uh, it had an update status hook, mm -hmm. and then it's like, oh, I'm doing stuff. So you can okay. talk to me later. Okay. Um, and and just why don't you give us a a, a a definition of where you're deploying this? I I was using Amazon and, and KVM, but it looks like you're using Maz on your system uh, at yes. home, right? I am using a, a Maz setup that's that's running KVM containers. Um, okay. This is running on top of Maz 1.8. Uh, I've got bridge networking set up. This is not by any means a, a super simple and straightforward setup. Uh, it's something that I spent a little little too long on, I will, I will admit. But uh, with Maz 1.9, it's going to be even better because mm -hmm. we'll have even more support for, for defining networking stuff, um, yep. which is also really interesting. I feel like I'm doing the, the Juju core team a disservice. Uh, there's two other things that I didn't cover now that uh, Matt just reminded me of. One is, is networking spaces, and this is something that we are looking at with uh, with the Kubernetes bits, especially with having a network partition with which to run different clusters of your applications. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like today. Uh, we started to look at network spaces. We haven't gotten any code uh, laid down that will support this and how we actually deploy it. We're hoping for is something that's a little more transparent and just a definition to the op to the operator. Um, but I, I think that in practice, there's going to be a little bit more that we need to look at there. Uh, the other side of this, um, which hat tip to Demeter and his team for the, the network spaces work, and as we're just starting to look at that, it's, it's looking pretty nice. Um, mm -hmm. The other hat tip that I owe is to the Moonstone team for, for payload tracking. Now, I did a blog about this last week. I don't expect everybody to read my blog. So the gist of that is that we get uh, an arbitrary ability now to deploy uh, a payload now with Juju. Like, we just illustrated several Docker-based payloads where we're spinning things up with Compose and we're spinning things up with Docker. And we now have a command that's called payload tag register where we can define classes in our metadata.yaml. I've actually got a couple of examples here. It uh, looks like Swarm just joined, so let's do this. Before I switch complete context, let me do Docker info. We now see that our second container, Stupid Match, is now online and joined the cluster. And all I had to do was Juju add in a swarm, and I've now got a scale out cluster. I can I could have easily added five, and then I would suddenly have you know, six units ready for me to start deploying my workloads against. And as you saw, I just ran a Docker compose up. That's where Swarm comes into play. It is a scheduler similar to Kubernetes, so it's going to figure out where it needs to put it, uh, how that's going to look, and uh, how that round robin distribution works. Um, there's a little bit more to go in there. It's a little more in depth, but that's more of a tutorial of Swarm and not about what we've done with Juju. So. Uh, we were talking about uh, payload registry, right? Um, let's see, charms, layers. 
So looking at this, we, we've got payloads here, and I've got this arbitrary thing here. It looks very similar to the YAML definition that we have for relationships. And these payloads are, this classification is just something that's, that's important to me as the operator. This could easily be uh, monitoring. This could be log aggregation. This can be a, a chat bot. This can be a web server, an application, anything. This is what you want to name your, your particular tracking. And then the type below here is, is one of a few distinct classes. Um, there's Docker payloads. There's KVM payloads. There's LexD payloads. Uh, and these are the three that I'm aware of today. I believe that this list is going to be growing as the feature continues to evolve. This is a very early release of this. It's just landed in 1.25, which I believe is now in stable. Or is it in devel? It's in stable, right? Yep, 125 landed uh, a couple days ago. Yep. Okay, perfect. I, I thought I read emails about that, but I've been running from, from Propose for so long that I... Uh, it's a fact, though. So, so the idea behind this particular feature is that now that... As the operator, I know that I've got all these services deployed, like specifically with K8s. We deploy Kubernetes. It's shipping a lot of things in that one charm. We've got C Advisor bundled in there. We've got a scheduler. We've got a proxy. We've got Kubelet. Uh, you know, all these different things. And it would be important to me as the admin to know that these particular processes were spun up on this unit, and the current status of them is running. Uh, so what payload registry allows me to do, or payload tracking, is that I can now... Uh, Oh my goodness. Uh, reactive idle RPG. We're looking at this. With this payload register, we, we now just pass in the, the, the class, the type, and then the ID of that. And whenever we juju list payloads, we'll get an output listing of all this. Um, I didn't actually deploy this because I don't have keys that I'm willing to expose over a Hangout. Um, but I will definitely be doing a follow-up with more of this. So uh, this is in the release notes. If you're interested in tracking what's actually shipping with your charm and exposing that to an operator, make sure that you check out the payload management status and grok that. It's, it's very arbitrary. It's just a data bag. You're stuffing values into it, and you're setting some status. Uh, it's, it's only pertinent to the charm author as far as what's being tracked, but make sure that you're considering your operators in mind whenever you start deploying something so that you can service more data to them. That's going to be important. Uh, things that are that are very like machine watchable. Whenever your status goes to stopped on a critical service, it is one example of why you might want this. Because if you just have that on a one second watch loop and you're constantly ingesting that data and parsing it, something goes down and you could not take an action on it. Um, that that's that's good. We should probably wrap up here. Um, so again, we're 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 calling for for assistance. If you're an expert in the container world or Kubernetes. Or, or swarm, you know. Please reach out to us. Let us know, um, you know, how you're using it. If you want to help, we'd be happy to work with you. This is a this is a a, a part where you can help us uh, guide us for the next release, for the next cycle. Uh, we're working on this stuff right now. This is all live code stuff, right? That we just barely got running before the demo or before the talk today. So. Um, so give us a uh, give us a, a shout out or or a call um, on the mailing lists on IRC. Uh, you can email us directly. You know whatever you need to do, just let us know um, what you're interested in and how and and you know we'll uh, we can work on that going forward. So um, what other? I, I had one quick question, uh, Chuck. What other things could we could we conceivably track on with the payload stuff? Could we? Um, I know you said it's a data bag, but what, 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 give me an example of other things that we could track other than application containers. Well, say that you are running a Tomcat WAR file, for example, and that gets a particular UID when you register that with Tomcat. That's something that you can do. And then in an update status hook, you can, can, you know, you can continually pull that and check for a change. The only thing that's required to update it is that, that name that you define the, the payload itself, right? Like I had a Slack bot in my example made at data.yaml. Mm -hmm. So it'd be you know status set Slack bot ID stopped if it's no longer running. Okay. Okay. Great. It's it's I think it's I think it's important to note that we can track more than just Docker uh, or uh, application containers with with payload tracking management. So read the release notes, check it out. Let us know if you have any feedback on that. We'd be we'd be happy to hear that and, and work with you on those too. 
Awesome. And with that, we're done. Thanks, fellas. I snuck out to get some caffeine while you guys were gone. Was the talk good? I hope it was. <laughs> yeah, it was good. <laughs> All right. Top of the hour, uh, everybody else will be coming back with some uh, big data Hadoop bundles and whatnot. Thanks, guys. And right. uh, we'll see you out there on IRC in the mailing list. Thanks. All right. Bye.